Today, we are taking a look at the philosophy and ecology behind James Cameron's Avatar. It's the year 2154, and humans have just discovered the planet Pandora. In order to mine precious mineral air, they begin investigating the local indigenous population using surrogate Navi bodies. Jack Sully takes the place of his brother and begins training for the Pandora program. We have an indigenous population of humanoids called the Navi. They're fond of arrows dipped in a neurotoxin that'll stop your heart in one minute. Just at the start of the movie. We are shown two contrasting groups representing Western and non-Western civilization. The Navi are presented as fierce savages, while the Westerners are presented as a civilizing influence on the indigenous. You know, I mean, we we we, we try to give them medicine, education,、uh, uh, roads, but no, 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 they like mud. Here we see the head administrator Selfridge using the same rhetoric as U.S. President Bush during the invasion of Afghanistan. At the same time, the oppressed people of Afghanistan will know the generosity of America and our allies. As we strike military targets, we will also drop food, medicine, and supplies to the starving and suffering men and women and children of Afghanistan. This rhetoric of civilizing mission used by the U.S. was applied to the investigation of Pandora, causing Jake to believe that every creature is a potential enemy once he arrived. But as the story progresses, we see that the reality is exactly the opposite. Rather than killing Jake, the female Navi Natiri actually saves Jake by shooting the viper wolves that he alarms during the night. I just want to say thanks for killing those things.、Ah! You don't thank for this. This is sad. Well, this is your fault. They did not need to die. This encounter reveals two different attitudes toward nature: the civilized approval of killing animals in self-defense. While the Navi believe in animism, everything in nature is imbued with a soul, which shares in the spiritual power of Mother Earth, Iwa. And after death, all spirits return to Iwa. Iwa is embodied in the clan's home tree, for which they are able to communicate with their ancestors. It is this belief that prevents the Navi from leaving the home tree. Interestingly. The Warani in the Amazon rainforest have a similar origin myth. They believe that when the world was first created, every living being, whether human or animal, lived in a giant kapok tree. At first, there was no difference between humans and animals. But one day, a group of demons appeared and tried to kill the Warani. So the ancient heroes fell the giant tree, which then became the Amazon rainforest, where the Warani escaped to safety. The pitch palms of the rainforest provided shelter and abundant natural resources, so they had no need to develop agriculture or domesticate animals. Instead, they developed a symbiotic relationship with the spirits of the forest. This animist belief system protected the Amazon rainforest from extraction. It's also the reason indigenous societies and natural resources were always discovered at the same time because of indigenous peoples' adherence to a sustainable lifestyle. Their lands were preserved intact until their discovery by outsiders. In the movie, the Navi and the animals can form a special bond that allows them to communicate without the use of spoken words. You may tell her what to do inside. This ability also appeared in biologian Augustine's description of the prelapsarian world. At one time, humans did not regard animals as inferior and could communicate directly with them using the power of reason. Pandora symbolizes precisely this world before the fall of man, when humans and animals could communicate directly through a special bond and neither dominated over the other. Just as the Warani of the Amazon refuse to domesticate wild animals, the one who introduces Jake to this Garden of Eden is the scientist Grace Augustine. You need to listen to what she says. Try to see the forest through her eyes. But why is animism so common in many indigenous cultures worldwide? Anthropologist E. B. Tyler was the first to provide an explanation for this. When indigenous people saw deceased people in their dreams. They believed that they were seeing the spirit world their ancestors inhabit, and since animals, plants, and minerals also appear in the spirit world, they must all have their own spirit too. This theory was convenient for Europeans to legitimize colonialism in the 19th century, 
claiming that animism was a primitive superstition that confused the dream world with the real world. Interestingly, the juxtaposition between dream and reality appears in Avatar again. After Jake falls asleep, he enters the dream-like world of animism, the Navi society. As he spends more time with the locals, the animist world resonates more and more with him, until he has a hard time telling which world is actually real. Everything is backwards now. Like out there is the true world, and in here is the dream. Though he started out working for the colonizers, Jake stops trying to change Navi's view and has his own view changed instead. Only after the mining company destroys the home tree is Jake finally forced to wake up from his Pandora dream. Sooner or later, though, you always have to wake up. Similarly, in the movie Dances with Wolves, after joining a North American indigenous group. The protagonist is surprised to learn they are not the warlike Indians he's heard of, but an egalitarian society where everyone can debate on an equal footing with others. After returning to white society and encountering inhuman treatment, he decides to fight the white colonizers with the indigenous. In the TV series The White Lotus, the kid surrounded by wealth discovers that paddling a canoe on the ocean is a more authentic life than playing video games every day. After a chance encounter with local indigenous in Hawaii, this experience makes him feel unable to fit in white society anymore. In all of these examples, we see civilized individuals end up living among barbaric indigenous and then find it to be a more authentic way of living, while those in the so-called civilized world end up seeming like the real barbarians. This change in perspective was actually quite common during the U.S. colonial expansion of the 18th century. As James Cameron stated, the story of Avatar is actually rooted in this period of history. The historical perspective is that when indigenous populations who are at a bow and arrow level are met with technologically superior military forces that have muskets, you know, blunderbusses and, and ships and horses with armor and so on, which is the history of the colonial period. White prisoners of war captured by American indigenous people were taken back as slaves. The prisoners were surprised to discover that there was gender equality and no forced labor among indigenous societies, while Europeans in industrial cities were forced to toil under capitalism. They were happier living in indigenous society, even as prisoners of war, than living as laborers in European cities. These people then became what the historian Colin Calloway called white renegades. And this led American founding father Benjamin Franklin to remark, no European who has tasted savage life can afterwards bear to live in our societies. In the same way, after experiencing the Pandoran lifestyle, Jake and Grace lead the opposition against civilized society. The wealth of this world isn't in the ground, it's all around us. The Navi know that and they are fighting to defend it. The expression of their voice reveals a problem. Why can't the indigenous speak up for themselves? Why do they need the help of a white savior? It's as if without the testimony of a westerner or the proof of western science, indigenous voices would never be heard. Which leads us to the question proposed by the literary theorist Gayatri Spivak, can the subaltern speak? When the elites study the knowledge of the oppressed subaltern, on the surface, it seems like an attempt to increase the understanding of the oppressed. How's your not me? But in fact, it reflects the plight of the Spoltan who have no voice of their own. Without this translation by the intellectual elites, their voices would remain unintelligible. However, this process of translation once again marginalizes the oppressed. In order to understand the history of indigenous people all over the world, one has to read sources and colonial archives in European languages. Since the indigenous had no written languages, their voices were always recorded by the European missionaries and colonial officers. But as soon as their words are translated into the language of others, something unique to their voice is lost in translation and replaced by that of intellectual thought. With your permission, I will speak now. You would honor me by translating. This is also why James Cameron asked linguist Paul Former to create a language for the Navi. 
His linguistic element of the movie highlights the plight of colonized people. Without the language of the colonizers as an intermediary, the indigenous become mute, unable to be recognized. Only with Jake and Grace as translators can the Western colonizers understand why the Navi won't move. Ironically, even after the Western scientists explain the significance of the home tree, the mining company still insists on exploiting the resources there. The Western colonizers are unable to see the importance of the home tree for the locals. This brings us to the seeing metaphor found throughout the movie. Sky people cannot learn to do not see. Well, then teach me how to see. No one can teach you to see. Why does she say that humans can't really see? In the movie, people don't have a deficiency of sight, but rather an excess of it. The scientists assess things as true when they can be seen. The forest electrical signals are scanned by an instrument, and daily discoveries are to be recorded as a video diary. We gotta get in the habit of documenting everything. You know what we see, what we feel. It's all part of the science. And good science is good observation. As historian Martin J critiques, Western civilization is plagued by ocular centrism. Only things that can be seen by everyone are the standards of objective truth. Plato used sun as a metaphor for the source of knowledge, in the sense that it makes everything visible to human eyes. Descartes discovered that our senses can deceive us, and long to devise a fully objective system of representation, which resulted in his invention of the coordinate system. It was also in Descartes' time that Europeans invented the telescope. Which overcame the limited resolution of the human eye and allowed us to see more objectively. Even today, scientists continue to develop more advanced telescopes and microscopes so as to get a better glimpse of the truth about mankind and the universe. This ocular centrism can backfire, though, as it leads to the misconception that seeing alone can lead to the truth. This explains the use of video logs to keep records. Scientists in the forest only think about collecting samples and quantifying the organisms they study. As soon as the colonizers see the mineral resources there, they rush to exploit them and trace out the native population. But this over-reliance on sites results in them missing out on something very important to the locals. Iwa is omnipresent, embodied by the ecosystem. This explains why Grace was unable to successfully transfer herself to an avatar body. It was not only that she was injured; her scientific bias prevented her from seeing the animist world. It was only on her deathbed that she finally truly saw Iwa. I'm with her, Jake. She's real. Jake, on the other hand, does not suffer from the bias of scientific positivism. He can learn to see as the Navi see, and is chosen by the sacred spirit of Iwa. My cup is empty. Trust me. Just ask Doctor Augustine. I'm no scientist. This also explains why Jake's character is a disabled marine. He is just learning how to use his body, much like a little child. As one who comes to Pandora to learn, he is not bound by ocular centrism, but focuses heavily on his sense of touch and perceiving his environment through direct interaction. Avatar thus challenges ocular centrism. Excessive reliance on sight is actually a deficiency. This is precisely the critique found in 20th century surrealist art, which deliberately rejects our sense of sight, violating the laws of perspective and other visual conventions. In the film *An Andalusian Dog*, Buñuel even slices a human eye right open. These critiques of ocular centrism allow us to consider things from a new perspective. In modern civilized society, everyone is disabled as they have lost their eye for nature. But by returning to animist society, they can recover and become a whole person, re-establishing a connection with nature and regaining their humanity. But why did people become blind after creating civilization? What made us unable to see? Let's take a step back from Pandora and examine how humans' planet is portrayed. The Earth seems like a sunless place full of air pollution. Television news reported that humans had successfully cloned the extinct Bengal tiger through biotechnology. Yet this high-tech future society is still facing an ecological disaster. So they must continue colonizing other planets in the search for more resources. 
In this sense, Avatar is a film that is warning us of mankind's potential future. How come the Western Enlightenment project has progressed to this point of self-destruction, yet people are still unaware of the ecological disaster it has created? Actually, in the days of ancient Greece, people once believed in animism. The woodland was seen as a place ruled by wood nymphs and Artemis, the goddess of the forest. Hunters all respected Artemis's laws and would not overhunt or overexploit the land. Legend has it that the ancient Greek king Erysichthon cut down a sacred tree belonging to Demeter, goddess of agriculture, in order to renovate his palace. Demeter then punished him with everlasting hunger. But when ancient Greece moved from the age of mythology into the age of philosophy, nobody believed in the wood nymphs or goddess of agriculture anymore. This is when deforestation problems really began in ancient Greece. Philosophy taking the place of mythology marked the beginning of ecological destruction. As philosopher Adorno argues, the Enlightenment project results in Western civilization's self-destruction because the Enlightenment itself is a deception, a new form of mythology. The moderns still have not truly awakened from the dark shroud of mythology and are still just as superstitious as the primitive people they disdain. Their superstition is rational scientific analysis. Their mythology is the accumulation of capital and the endless economic growth. Killing the indigenous looks bad, but there's one thing that shareholders hate more than bad press, and that's a bad quarterly statement. The ancient and the indigenous animism is a superstition that endows things with souls. Whereas scientific industrialism is a superstition that makes souls into things. Labor, land, and the environment that sustains one's own life are all subject to exploitation. Since capitalism advocates rational calculation of profits, when it is faced with environmental disasters, slowing down economic development is not an option. Instead, even more money is invested to develop weather control systems so that more profits can be extracted from an ecological crisis. After the Earth has been fully exploited, space technology can be developed so as to colonize another planet. Ecological disasters have not awakened the moderns from the dream of the Enlightenment. People are still under the illusion that science and economic development can solve all problems. The scientific Enlightenment has become a new mythology. Even though scientists have warned us that economic development cannot take precedence over the ecosystem, those in power continue to turn a blind eye to scientific knowledge. They can upload and download data, memories, at sites like the one you just destroyed. What the hell have you people been smoking out there? Suffrage's denial of ecological knowledge mirrors the attitude of today's most powerful countries toward the climate crisis. Billions have been invested in climate research by countries around the world, but all the warnings from climate scientists have been ignored or even denied by politicians. After Trump came into office, the US even denied global warming, pulling out of the Paris Agreement. Just like in the movie Joe Stone, the natural disasters that suddenly popped up around the globe were initially attributed to global warming but were later revealed to be deliberately created by American officials using weather controlling technology to avoid handing power over to the United Nations. Similarly, the climate crisis we are facing today is not a purely natural disaster, but rather a man-made disaster caused by the warnings of climate scientists going unheeded by the US for the last 40 years. Avatar paints a picture of the potential consequences of ignoring climate science. Trying to deny what nature is telling us will result in nature fighting back with a vengeance. The philosopher Bruno Latour points out the reason modern man is unable to deal with the climate crisis is because we fail to notice non-human agency at play. Since the scientific revolution of the 17th century, humans have viewed themselves as the protagonist of history. Animals, plants, and nature only play supporting roles in the background. They are simply passive resources being used by humans. Now, however, nature is answering back with its own voice, and is telling us that non-human existences have the power to influence society and change the course of human history. Wait, can we really consider nature in the same light as humans? 
Recently, there have been more and more findings that animals and plants can communicate with each other, and are even able to make moral judgments on their own. There is some kind of electrochemical communication between the roots of the trees, like the synapses between neurons. The communication system Grace is talking about is referred to by scientists as the wood white wave. Biologist Susanna Zemar discovered that the underground roots of plants form a cooperative network of fungi, for which trees can communicate and share resources, spreading information about which one is lacking nutrients. Nutrients can pass from adult trees to younger trees via this wood white wave, as if these trees are taking care of others' needs. This implies that plants may have a natural egalitarian consciousness. In the animal kingdom, there are countless studies showing that animals may also have a sense of justice, and the moral judgments of right and wrong are not strictly the domain of humans. Scientists have discovered that if a rat can obtain food by pressing a button, but when pressing the button, another rat is given an electric shock, but the rat will refuse to press it. It's as if the rat knows this is morally wrong. The rat would rather sacrifice its self-interest than let one of its own kind suffer. This makes biologist Mark Beckhoff believe that animal society includes a sense of reciprocal justice. Moral consciousness appeared long ago in nature, and humans are just a part of this system, not the top of the evolutionary ladder. Similarly, in Avatar, Iwa was thought to be maintaining a balance. Not playing favorite. However, in the end, she decides to help the Navi in their fight against the capitalist colonizers, as if the nature can also respond to human world as a moral agent. These recent scientific discoveries cast nature in a brand new light for us. Indigenous animism suddenly appears very scientific. Only in recent years has modern science finally realized that animals have morality. And ecosystems value balance and reciprocal justice. Now is the time to learn anew from the indigenous, to listen to their knowledge, to coexist with the ecosystem, to face the reality of the disappearing natural world that we depend on for our livelihoods, to rethink why we need endless economic growth, and to finally wake up from the myth of the enlightenment.